And we're going to be talking about the new PDUPA legislation that's up in front of Congress right now. One of the most important aspects of this legislation is that it provides for accelerated approval for rare disease drugs. Could you tell me a little bit about what's important about that? Yeah, I'll tell you what's really very important is that for so many rare diseases, there is no treatment at all. Of the 400 products that have now been approved, they only treat about 250 rare conditions, and there are 7,000 rare conditions, so you can understand the urgency that the patients feel to get products to market as quickly as possible, and that's why accelerated approval, although it's already being used by the FDA now, codifies and gives them increased authority, will be so important for people with rare diseases. Well, one of the aspects about this is that it allows, it provides uh, for an approval based on a surrogate endpoint, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. which I find really fascinating because it takes away some of the historical demands that you had for some very high bars that you had to meet on the R&D process, and allows you to look at something that indicates it's going to work. Well, what does that mean when you can get an approval based on a surrogate endpoint for the patient population? Uh, uh, for so many condi rare conditions, they don't know a lot about the natural histories of a rare disease, um, and it's difficult to identify what that surrogate marker might be. So basically, the importance of a surrogate endpoint will allow the manufacturers, the innovators, to uh, test a product in clinical trial with patients at a much sooner rate. So that's terribly important for people with rare diseases. What are the other key issues that are up in front of Congress now in this PDUPA legislation that you find is most important for the patient population that you represent? Something that's really obscure that people haven't picked up on a lot is the fact that they free authorized the Open Product Research Grant Program and put in a technical correction that will allow an innovator or a researcher to apply for these research grants without getting uh, uh, a designation as an orphan product first, which was seen as a roadblock by the FDA. There's also the Expert Act that will give greater um, power to the patients to have them interact more with the reviewers. Um, a great importance to the rare disease community is risk. Patients with rare diseases are willing to take on a far greater degree of risk than someone with you know, are a threat at the elbow. So um, being able to communicate that level of risk tolerance to the actual reviewers is pretty critically important. And I, I, one of the things that I found was very remarkable about this was that this is all taking place in a very bipartisan kind of an atmosphere, which you hardly ever see in Congress these days. Were, were there any, what, how did that come about, and, and, and are there any lessons here for anybody involved in legislation? <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people are really surprised that it, that it wasn't a, done in such a bipartisan manner, but um, the staffers did an incredible job of working with one another. Like in the Senate, they had working groups, so they divided up the PDUFA legislation among staff, and Republicans and Democrats sat down with one another, hammered out the differences, and came up with a very acceptable piece of legislation, so we're really pleased. And, you know, NORD has never been a partisan organization. Um, we've worked very closely with Republicans and Democrats because um, there's when people with rare diseases are Republican, Democrat, independent, it doesn't make any difference. So um, that's a relationship that we've built over time. And as you were telling me, there are 30 million people in the United States that have mm -hmm. a rare disease, which right. is a remarkable 10% of the population. Right. Something that a lot of people might not realize is something that really translates into everybody's home district. It does. It does. Um, it's one in 10 Americans, according to, to the NIH. Um, so some diseases can affect maybe two or three people, and up to 200,000. The Orphan Drug Act uh, defines a rare disease as any condition that affects less than 200,000 people. But the focus by industry has really been on these really small populations. If you look at the designations of orphan products, the majority of them are for conditions that treat less than 9,000 people in the United States. So. They're very, very focused on these small populations. Now, you've been working with NORD for about 12 years, I understand. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the organization. Okay. NORD was established back in uh, 1983 with the passage of the Orphan Drug Act, which created incentives for companies to develop these products for small populations. Um, we have um, 180 in organizations that are members and then individual members. And what we do primarily is make sure that patients have access to products. We provide services to get free product to the patients or to help them with their copay or their co-insurance. We work with companies to get people to come to trial sites. So that is a key role. We want to make sure that the industry continues to be incentivized to develop the products that are desperately needed.
You know, there are a few different things happening about rare diseases here at the convention. What are some of the most uh, important things or most interesting things, events that are happening here for you? Right. Well, the most exciting thing is the day and a half forum on rare diseases. So the entire focus is going to be on the incentives, the issues, talking about surrogate endpoints, um, and all those other issues. So that's really so important. Bio is really focusing on rare diseases. So we're really thrilled that it has occurred. Well, that's great. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. And that's it for us. Well, we have, oh, no, I have, this is live. <laughs> We've got more, a couple more questions. Um, what can people do to help advocate for patients with rare diseases? Um, if there's a particular disease that they have a, want to be focusing on, there are organizations. We have a, a database of patient organizations all over the country. They can go to our website and find out if there's a particular condition. Um, but some people don't understand that um, if you don't advocate for, all, for a particular rare disease, it's helpful to be talking about all the rare diseases um, because once we learn more about one particular disease, it's going to help the entire rare disease community. And when I talk about rare disease community, I mean researchers, patients, their families, caretakers, and industry. Uh, rare diseases has certainly been a hot topic on the R&D side in biotech. Right. A lot of people in the industry are focused on that. Uh, another question for you. Give us an example of a rare disease, uh, like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Duchenne's, something like right, and that affects only young boys. And there's also a condition called progeria, where children die of old age by the time um, they're maybe 12 or 13. There may be 40 to 50 children in the United States. So focusing on that, a lot of the focus is at the NIH right now on basic and translational research because we know that understanding the pathogenesis of rare diseases is going to increase sciences and the medical community's understanding of all rare diseases. Right. There's also been a lot of genetic research. Uh, we have a question, are many rare diseases genetic and can genetic research help? Uh, it has been said, and I'm not sure if that number is correct, that about 80% of the 7,000 known rare diseases are genetically based. So gene therapy is probably the holy grail, which would could be curative. So um, that's very important. That's great. Again, appreciate you taking the time, and that's a wrap. Thank you.